We're going to continue with Amos tonight, and uh, so to recap last week, uh, I'm going to, I found this video that I think is uh, well done, and this will, this will sort of bring us back to thinking about Amos. The book of the prophet Amos. Amos was a shepherd and a fig tree farmer who lived right near the border between northern Israel and southern Judah. Now, the north had seized its independence about 150 years earlier. Remember 1 Kings chapter 12? And it was currently being ruled by Jeroboam II, a successful military leader. He won lots of battles and new territory for Israel, and he generated lots of wealth. But in the eyes of the prophets, he was one of the worst kings ever. His wealth had led to apathy, and he allowed idol worship for the gods of Canaan, which in turn led to injustice and the neglect of the poor. And it got to the point where Amos could couldn't take it anymore. He sensed God calling him to go trek up north to Bethel, an important city that had a large temple, and start announcing God's word to the people. And this book is a collection of his sermons and poems and visions uttered over the years. They were compiled later to give God's people a sense of his divine message to the northern kingdom, and it's a message we still need to hear today. The book has a fairly clear design. Chapters 1 and 2 are a series of messages to the nations and Israel. Then chapters 3 to 6 are a collection of poems that express Amos' message to the people of Israel and its leaders. Chapters 7 through 9 contain a series of visions that Amos experienced that depict God's coming judgment on Israel. Let's just dive in. So the book opens with a series of short poems that accuse all of Israel's neighbors of violence and injustice. And this is kind of odd because the book's opening line said that Amos was going to speak against Israel. But watch how this works. As Amos is naming all of these neighboring nations, you can go look at a map and see that he's creating a circle. And when he's done, Israel lies right in the center, like a target in the crosshairs. And on Israel, Amos unleashes a poetic accusation that's three times longer and more intense than any of these others. He accuses Israel's wealthy of ignoring the poor and allowing grave injustice in their land, specifically by allowing the poor to be sold into debt slavery, and then going on to deny any of these people legal representation. And this, Amos asks, is this the family that was once denied justice and enslaved in Egypt? The family that God rescued from oppression and slavery? The party's over, Amos says. God is done putting up with you. And so the opening of the next section explains why. God says, I chose you, Israel, from among all the families of the earth. This is an allusion to Genesis 12, how God had called the family of Abraham to become God's blessing to all of the nations. And so then God says, so this is why I will punish you for all of your sin. Israel had a great calling which came with great responsibility, and so their sin and rebellion brings great consequences. Now this section brings together a lot of Amos's poems, and you'll see a few key themes repeated over and over. So first, he's constantly exposing the religious hypocrisy of Israel's wealthy and their leaders. And he describes how they faithfully attend the religious gatherings, giving offerings and sacrifices, all the while neglecting the poor and ignoring injustice. And Amos says it's all a sham, that God actually hates their worship because it's totally disconnected from how they treat people. God says a real relationship with him will transform a person's relationships. And so Amos is called to true worship is to let justice flow like a river and righteousness like a never-failing stream. Now, these two words, they're super important for Amos and actually all of the prophets. So righteousness, or in Hebrew, tzedakah, refers to a standard of right, equitable relationships between people no matter their social differences. And justice, or in Hebrew, mishpat, refers to concrete actions that you take to correct injustice and create righteousness. And so both of these are to permeate the life of God's covenant people like a rushing stream fills a dry riverbed. The next theme is Amos's repeated accusations of Israel's idolatry. So remember, when the northern kingdom broke away from southern Judah, their king built two new temples to rival Solomon's in Jerusalem, and he placed a golden calf in each. Remember 1 Kings chapter 12. Since then, Israel had only accumulated more idols, worshiping the gods of sex and weather and war. And in the prophet's view, the worship of these gods 
always led to injustice because these gods don't require the same degree of justice and righteousness as the God of Israel, not to mention that these gods were immoral themselves. Not the God of Israel, he's different. So he can say in one place, seek me that you may live. And then right after that, say to Israel, seek good, not evil, that you may live. So true worship of the creator God of Israel, it's synonymous with doing good, with generosity and with justice. And so the final theme in these chapters is that because Israel and its king have rejected Amos and the other prophets, God will send the day of the Lord. This is a great and terrible act of justice on Israel. And specifically, Amos predicts that a powerful nation will come and conquer and decimate their cities and take the people away into exile. And we know his prediction came true. Some 40 years later, the Assyrian Empire swooped in and did exactly as Amos had said. The book closes with a series of visions that Amos experienced and their symbolic depictions of the coming day of the Lord. So he sees Israel devastated by a locust swarm and then by a scorching fire and then they're being swallowed up like overripe fruit. And in the final vision, Amos sees God violently striking the pillars of Israel's great idol temple at Bethel and the whole building comes crumbling down. It's an image of God's justice on the leaders and the gods of Israel. Their end has finally come come. But then, all of a sudden, in the final paragraph, we see a glimmer of hope. It picks up this image of Israel as a destroyed building, and God says that out of the ruins, he will one day restore the house of David. In other words, he's going to bring the future messianic king from David's line, and he will rebuild the family of God's people, which, surprisingly, we're told, is going to include people from all of the nations. All of the devastation caused by Israel's sin and God's judgment will that day be reversed. Now, this final paragraph is super important. It's the only sign of hope on the other side of judgment. And it helps us see how this book is exploring the relationship between God's justice and his mercy. If God is good, he has to confront and judge evil among Israel and the nations. But his long-term purposes are to restore his world and build a new covenant family. And so through Amos' words, we still today hear his call to learn from Israel's hypocrisy and disaster and to embrace a true worship of this God, which should always lead to justice and righteousness and loving our neighbor. And that's what the book of Amos is all about. Uh, so just to recap, well, we left it with chapter one. Uh, uh, Amos is, uh, as the mouthpiece of God, is uh, pronouncing judgment on all the different kingdoms or or. Uh, empires that surround Israel, uh, some of them are just there because they're sharing space. Uh, Philistia, you've got Tyre, you've got uh, um, Syria or, or Aram. Now the other three, these two, th this one and, and uh, yeah, Amnon, Moab, and Edom, they're they're more they have more of a closer relationship than say the the, the first three that are mentioned. So as Amos is pronouncing these judgments, the first three are just those that are neighbors. Three are those that are, have some level, either a peace treaty or some level of connection uh, with Israel. And then in chapter 2, which is what we're going to look at today or tonight, the last one before Israel is obviously their kinfolk neighbor to the south, the, 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 the kingdom of Judah. And that's if on, your, uh, on your table is uh, 2, 4 through 16. And similar to the other judgments, this is what uh, Amos says to Judah, for three sins, uh, even for four, I will not relent because they have rejected the law of the Lord and have not kept his decrees because they have laid, uh, have been led astray by false gods, the gods their ancestors followed. I will send fire on Judah and will consume uh, the fortresses of, of Jerusalem. Notice that the language change if we were to go back and or think back with me to chapter 1, it, chapter 1, the other nations were being judged for how they treated their neighbors. Now, when we get to Judah, Judah is being judged not so much, well, to some degree, how they treat their neighbors, but they're also being judged because they are part of a covenant. Think about the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, that's what makes up, 10 of them make up Israel. Two of them make up Judah. 
And they were the ones that for, for a long period of time, it was just one group. They didn't split until after, after Solomon, but they were both covenant people, which meant that both of them uh, were given the Ten Commandments. They were bound to Yahweh through covenant. Uh, and, and so with that comes a greater responsibility, a greater obligation that is different than the surrounding countries. And so when Amos gets to, to, to Judah... What they are being faulted for is that they have forsaken the covenant that God gave them. They have rejected that, rejected the law, not kept, not kept the statutes of the law, and have been led astray uh, by their ancestors. Some versions say they, they followed in their father's footsteps. Basically, they canonized all the things that they uh, did wrong previously, uh, all, all tied to this understanding that they were part of the covenant. Um, it would be no different than, uh, I don't know if you, if you have children and, or, or grandchildren and you ever said this to your child, uh, because you know better, this. It's one thing to, to have an offense, but if, if someone doesn't know better, then the offense is just the offense. But if they know better, which means they have some level of, they're, they're an insider, they know what should do what they should do, how they should act, things of that nature, and then there is an offense, that would normally come with a greater level of punishment or, or a greater level of, of, of interaction. I, I know it did in my household. Uh, so, I mean, my parents, back to the right, they'll probably they'll say, no, they were blameless in that. But for us, who supposedly knew better, you know, we, it always came with some level of, uh, of a more detailed punishment where than if it was just the offense for the very first time. The Torah, think back to what the law is in the Old Testament. So the Torah, it's, it's not just the, the actual law, although that's part of it. What the Torah stood for, it, it was the instructions, by the, the guidance that God gave the children of Israel so that when they entered into the promised land, they would know how to live being connected to Yahweh. So it's not just the law itself, but it's what the law actually stood for, what it meant. In Exodus, Exodus chapter 19 is when both the children of Israel, at that time all 12 tribes, and God choose each other almost like they're in a marriage ceremony. Exodus 20 is where we get the Ten Commandments, and that's a gift that God gave the people so that as they move into this new place that has, is, is filled with uncertainty, they wouldn't lose their way. So it's not just the actual law itself, it's what the law stood for, and the law stood for that they were tied to God in a covenant relationship. And because they knew better and still broke it, then you can see how the punishment is a little bit more than just the surrounding, the surrounding uh, empires when Amos gets to Judah. So they canonized uh, a, a way of life that was not tied to the covenant, and in choosing to do so, then what they basically were saying to God is that the Torah, our covenant, doesn't matter. I think in the video it said um, either like great privilege or, or something, you know, if, if you know better or if you're an insider, then you're held to a different level of accountability. So for me and us, we're reading about Amos and his interaction with, uh, with Israel and with Judah at this particular time. And one of the questions we can ask ourselves is, how are we like Judah? Where we know what we should be doing, we know the path that we should be following, and yet we do not. Or even if we did it, say, if we took a positive spin, as if to say, Judah is being faulted because some of their history they were not obedient, and yet now the present generation, or at least the contemporaries of Amos, are following in what it used to be, and they were doing it wrong. What about us who say, well, my parents or my grandparents, all these people who came before me, well, they, they were faithful. I don't really have to do anything because I can just get by on their faith as well. So it's one of the things that we can ask of ourselves when it comes to how are we like Judah? Or, or do we pick and choose the part of the covenant that we keep with God that we want to be faithful to and then disregard the things that we want to omit 
or not paying attention or pay much attention to it. So this is Judah. And Judah being, is, is being faulted because they were given something that these other nations did not receive, and yet they treated it as if it was non-existent. But now the real thrust of the book has to do with Israel itself, and that's the one right in the middle. And the, the Amos's first words to, to Israel are about three times longer than anybody else's. So if you're just looking at chapter 2, and you see, what, two verses set aside for Judah, but then you look and you see, uh, you know, ten verses set aside for Israel, just the length of the material long is a cause of concern. And so Amos, uh, under the direction of God, puts the crosshairs on Israel and then begins to describe what's going on with Israel and while they're in trouble. Both of them are bound to Yahweh, which means they are part of the covenant. They receive the covenant. They're accountable to it. And both of them have disregarded. Judah, you get a little bit of insight, but with Israel, you get a fair amount. And that is this. This is what shows up in the passage. And on the front side of your sheet is where Amos is listing the things that Judah has disregarded about the covenant. On the back side of the sheet, what you have is God laying out his case for why God will be just going forward. So what is it that put Israel in the crosshairs? And they have rejected the law of the Lord. There's that covenant interaction. They have not. Uh, they, uh, they, they have also treated uh, and abused the, the innocent and the poor. At the same time, they practice idolatry. Often that scene, or in the Old Testament, that is, uh, there's, sometimes there's sexual language that is used there. And then the final one is that they, they approached God in acts of worship, uh, um, where they, uh, actually what the text says, they approached God clothed in their economic abuses, um, or they, lay, they lie down beside every altar on garments taken in the pledge. And, and, and there's some, some, some code words there that we'll, we'll get into in just a second. But there's three things that Amos faults Israel for. And it all has to do with the fact that they were given this covenant and what's woven into the center and to the, to, to the foundation of the covenant is not only how they treat God, but how they treat another person. And they, uh, they're, they're, the way they treat each other is they're taking advantage of the poor. So those that are wealthy or those that are in the, the power structures of, of their society... They disregard that, and actually they abuse that at the hands of the poor. Some of them even maybe have sold the poor into slavery or to debtor's prison. At the same time, uh, they created a, 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 just, a, a judicial system that benefited the wealthy at the expense of the poor, which has put them in the crosshairs with God. They trample on the heads of the poor, this is verse 7, as, as on the dust of the ground. They deny justice to the oppressed. In the video, how uh, they would use their wealth to seize their property and then put, would sell people into a debtor's prison and then create a false judicial system so there would be no rights on behalf of those that are now in debtor's prison. At the same time, they practice idolatry. Uh, this is not the first time that that's used with sexual language. It shows up in Hosea, sh shows up in, in Jeremiah, and it, it, it's code words from prophets for where a person has forsaken their vows, their covenant vows, and have, have now lived with this broken co uh, covenant. And then the last one is this idea of what they do in worship to where they would still go to these two centers in worship, one being in the south, Beth Bethel, the other being in the north, in the area of Dan. Those that went to Israel a few years ago, we were way up in the north and we saw the, the mouth of, of um, for the Sea of Galilee. That area that we traveled there, that was Dan. And we saw actually the foundation of what one of these temples, where it actually was located. I don't know if you remember, it was, I mean, it was huge. It was probably, you know, it went up in different levels, two or three different levels, uh, but they would go to these places of worship and Basically, if you can imagine if, uh, if, if, if what you received from throwing someone in debtor's prison, you would take that into to worship and, and sort of taunt that. 
as if to, to say, this is what I got. You know, I was able to gouge this person. And, and they did that even as an act of worship. So for God, not only are they worshiping places, worshiping idols, but they're, even when they bring that forward in their worship, whether it be with how they look, how they act, it's like a double offense because they've, they have, they're growing on the backs of those that they have taken uh, advantage of. So what Amos does is he lists the three offenses that puts Israel, the kingdom of Israel, in jeopardy with God. And then what he does in verse 9 through 16 is, is God makes a case. He makes a case uh, for that, that, again, think about this covenant um, Think about this covenant faithfulness that Israel did not keep. But what, what Amos wrote, or what Amos said in verses 9 through 16, is that he lays out this case that even though the kingdom of Israel has not been faithful, God has been faithful. And so you get where, there, where God recounts all the things that he has done for Israel. He destroyed the Amorites. Now, those were the people that were in the promised land before the Israelites. He delivered Israel from Egyptian bondage. He led Israel out for 40 years. He gave them a land, and then he raised them up with pious leaders. And you have this uh, in verse 11. Uh, you have uh, where he reminded them that he gave them prophets. At the same time, he gave them Nazarites. And, and prophets were the people that uh, were... were the, the role of the prophet is that they would be used in a way to keep Israel going forward, facing the right direction. The Nazarites were the ones that, if you can imagine, the, the people of piety. So you have, you have the leaders who, who guided Israel, kept them on the right path, and then the Nazarite, those would be the prophets. And then you had the Nazarites were the ones that they modeled their life in pious living. And so these two gifts that God gave Israel... To, to stay on the right path, and then to model what it's like to live in piety with God, Israel abused them too. So it's not just the fact that they have taken advantage of their neighbors and, their, and, and those that are on the fringes of society, the poor, the widows, the, the things of that nature. They've also uh, cooked the system so that they, there would be this perpetual abuse going over and over and over and then one of the last straws is what God reminds him of, is that even the people I gave you that were gifts to see you through, you have, uh, you have taken advantage of them as well. So verse 13, because of all of this, now here comes, you're going to live in to the consequences of your actions. And you get this image of a cart that's moving down a hill that's, that's loaded with grain, and, and as it's going down the hill, that there's nothing that can stand in its way or, or stop it. And what we will know in about 40 years from now, that's the Assyrians. So within a generation, roughly, of the people that Amos is giving uh, or gave these proclamations to, they will literally watch that come to be in the form of the Assyrians that eventually wipe out the ten tribes of Israel. Now, we know a little bit about this in the Gospels because that begins this Sumerian Jew problem that existed in the days of Jesus. So you have Amos. He's one of the last prophets who is, prophet, who is given direction to this kingdom, asking them, you know, calling them for into a place of repentance, and yet they will not. And it's, about, it's just a matter of years before this judgment actually come to be. So this is, again, chapter 2, the verses tonight, it sits within this, this larger first third of the book, chapters 1 and 2, where Amos is, is because, of their, of, because of kingdom's inability to care and to treat their neighbor in a fair way, God has, is now the judge, the judger of all nations, but eventually it narrows down on Israel because they have broken their covenant. And they have not, uh, to use the language that we pray in our uh, communion, they have not heard the cry of the needy, uh, and they have, have, have turned and walked in another direction. Now, at the close of two, and this is what we'll look at next week, John's going to help us here next week, uh, 
is that this begins then, verse chapters 3 through 6, where the, there are these different poems that Amos will take. If you can imagine uh, pushing a, an app on your phone, what, we, what we're talking about tonight, and if you were to push it to go deeper, you're going to get that in verses three through, I mean, chapters 3 through 6. He's going to go in greater detail of what uh, done or, or not done when it comes to how they treat their neighbors. And then the very last part of the book, uh, chapters 7 through 9, if you can take uh, this little bit about what judgment's going to come, then you have images about uh, what that's going to look like uh, through uh, the last three chapters. One of the things we always want to do when we read Scripture is we, want, we read it for what it says, but at the same time, we want to apply it to our life. And in this case, it has to do with covenant faithfulness. The idea of, of re- acknowledging the gift that you've been given by God and in relationship with God and then allowing that to, be, to have its full uh, effect inside of your relationships, inside of your life, everything that you are, that is that God's through His Spirit wants to be a part of all of that. Not just the things that we can pick and choose. It is, it is everything is what God is after. That's the lesson that we can learn from Amos tonight, particularly when it comes to Israel. How we treat, how we love God, and then how we treat the people around us. Let's pray. Oh God, as we try to cover these verses, and, and all of these are, are filled with all types of images, and we could spend so much time just in the different phrases and, and the wording of the passage, uh, and yet the, the thousand meter view is enough. Uh, we've all been given gifts, just like Judah, just like Israel, and with them is uh, part of a covenant that we, we say yes to. And what we want to do is we, we not just want to be faithful, we want it to be something that is completely and fully a part of our life in, in every way imaginable. And so work with us through your Spirit as we seek to live out uh, our covenant with you, that you would find us not just walking hand in hand with you, but that it would manifest itself in our relationships, how we see each other, and then what we do with those that are around us. God, these that are here tonight, O oh God, continue to watch over them and to watch all, all, over all of us. We give thanks again for the time around the table, for the food, for the, the fellowship, to see and to be close to each other. And so keep us safe in the, from one week to the next. Uh, this we pray in your name. Amen.